Uh, so every once in a while, uh, somebody asks me, how do you guys get ideas for sermons? How do you figure out what it is we're going to be doing? And uh, uh, we're in a series of messages now that started last week with Chris, and uh, uh, it's going to continue on for a while. And it comes out of a witness with Molly a couple of weeks ago. I was interviewing her up here, and uh, something she said really struck us. And uh, I was I asked her what you know the challenge, what she was thinks was ahead for her, and said basically to the fact this is not a direct quote, uh, but um, to the effect of um, I want to know how what it is to follow Christ besides just being a Sunday Christian. Besides just, you know, you come to church on Sunday and then you live your life. But what does it mean to, to actually follow Christ uh, with my life? And that got us thinking, yeah, what does that mean? How, whoa, how do we do that? How do we uh, follow Jesus in a way that's meaningful and that uh, takes over all of our life and not just, uh, okay, we've got this kind of religious side and we show up at church, you know, or something like that. And... Uh, and so uh, we've, we're going to do the series of messages on, on looking at, in the Old Testament, when, how God calls different people, uh, and each one is unique and different, just as the way God speaks into our lives is unique and different for each one of us, because we're all different, and uh, he has different things for us. But, uh, but I believe that, uh, that God made us and knows us and calls us by name and, and invites us to a great adventure of following him in our lives. And uh, sometimes we don't know exactly what that means or, or where we're going. And, uh, and so that's why we kind of travel together. Today, um, I want us to look at a passage in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, last week, Chris started us off looking at the Moses, called the Moses. Uh, and, uh, and now we're going to look at uh, uh, God's call to Abraham. Uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, starting the first verse. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, leave your people, and leave your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you. And I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I'll curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old, get that, uh, when he set out from Haran, and he took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions that they'd accumulated, and all the people that they'd acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, and at the time the Canaanites were in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent uh, with Bethel on the east and uh, I on the west. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. So Lord, teach us. Teach us what it means to be called by you, to follow you, and, uh, and to see your hand uh, shaping us in our lives uh, in really um, tangible, tangible ways. We need that today. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we all have our lives, right? Our regular lives. And, uh, and we have our faith. We have a relationship with God uh, and uh, in Jesus. And um, how do those things integrate? Um, I think part of what we have to look at, we, we don't just come into, uh, like you come in today, free from a background. Anybody here have a background? You know, some, you know, some of it's recent uh, background. And some of it is uh, it's shaped who you are, how you relate to people, what, what you're queasy about, what you're confident in. Uh, for example, um, next weekend, I'm going to experience something I've never experienced in my entire life. All 85 years of my life, I, uh, I have never experienced this before. And that is my brother, Florence, and my 
I mean, my brother Richard and my sister Florence, see, I'm already nervous about it, uh, <laughs> with their spouses are coming to visit us. And they have never visited us in my entire life, ever. No matter where we live, near or far, they've never set foot in our home. And they called up a couple of uh, weeks ago and said, we were having dinner and we thought, we've never visited John and Eileen, why don't we go visit them? Dang! <laughs> what do we do now? Uh, so anyway, they're coming in next, next weekend and uh, I thought, isn't it weird that there's things in my life that I carry with me and I feel nervous just telling you that they're coming into town, you know? Uh, there, my family is who we visit so we can leave when we want, you know, <laughs> uh, which we do. You know? so, um, anyway, so here we have the situation. Abraham, who, who has a life and he has uh, his own issues and stuff going on. And God breaks into it and says, I, I want something new for you. I want something different for you. I'm calling you to get up and leave where you are. Leave your home, leave your people, leave, uh, your, leave your father's house. That must have been, you know, Sarah was probably going, it's about time we get out of dad's house. You're 75 years old, you're still living at home? Come on, you know, <laughs> leave your father's house. That's what it says, you know, and, uh, and go, and I'll tell you when you get there. That's the call that Abraham got. And the promise on the other side of that is, I'll make you a great nation. All the people of the world will be blessed because of you. And isn't it interesting that Abraham is considered the, the spiritual father to not just Christians, but Jewish people and also Muslims. And Abraham is kind of this uniting of the whole world. So this actually did come pretty true. And uh, leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's house and go to the place that I'll show you. So Abraham responds to this and leaves. And, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in sermons uh, talking about how we need to travel light, okay? And Jesus sent his disciples out, and he said, don't take anything with you, don't take any money, don't take an extra coat or anything, and I'll just, you know, trust God. So I've been taking that as a, you know, for most of the time, I say, just, you know, go light, see what God does, you know, in your life, right? I've encouraged you to do that. This is against that. This is saying, you know, if you want to, if you want to pack the motor home with everything you've got, go ahead. Take it all with you. Take it all. Isn't that weird? Abraham says, great, I'm leaving everything. I'm, and he went with him and he, and he took, he took his wife. Well, that's, that's good. We're there. Uh, he took his nephew. All the possessions that they'd accumulated. In 75 years, everything that they've accumulated, these are, these are uh, hoarders, I'm just saying, you know. Uh, they, they took it all, they packed that stuff up, and all the people that they'd accumulated. Take them all, friends, family, servants, everything, just take them all with you. So he, he really, literally looted the town and, uh, and packed up and left. Now, I, I think about that and I go, Wait, God doesn't want us to take with us all of our stuff. Because I know some of you have stuff. I, I'm not telling them what it is, but we know. And I've got stuff. I, I came in here today with a certain amount of baggage, like Chris was preaching about last week, or a couple of weeks ago, uh, when we talked about the luggage that we carry with us. And I've always thought, if you're going to have an adventure of faith, if you're going to step out in faith, that you need to be lim limber and flexible and not burdened down with stuff. But that's harder to do than we think because we have accumulated. Um, so I have a new mental picture for, for the Christian life, okay? We're stepping out in faith, and I want to think about, remember those pioneers? You weren't around when it happened. I was, I was, but you weren't. But uh, the pioneers, you know, they left St. Louis, uh, which the ark, you know, then St. Louis, it, it says uh, the gateway to the west. I'm thinking if you have to fly four hours to get there, that's not the gateway. You know, that's, <laughs> that's almost east coast. But uh, anyway, the pioneers loaded up their uh, cover wagons and the stuff, and they headed west. 
and they took everything with them, just like Abraham, right? And I thought, maybe this is a, a picture for us as a Christian life. We, we, we head out on this great adventure. We're going we're gonna to follow Christ, and, and we've got all our stuff with us. But when they came to that really big hill, like Colorado, and they're trying to push the wagon up the hill, they're thinking, you know, it's time to throw out Grandma's piano. I'm just saying, let's lose that thing. And then they come somewhere else and they go, you know, we don't need that uh, case of stuff. You know, that's gone. Pretty soon, by the time, by the time they reached California, they were traveling light. And I think, think about this for the Christian life. If we start out with a bunch of stuff and it doesn't bother God that we're carrying our stuff, God's not intimidated by your baggage. And so we, we start out pretty soon. We get to the point where we make choices. You know, I don't need to carry that pain anymore. I think I can let go of this thing that's been part of my identity. I think I can kick that weight off, you know. And and pretty soon we've made the choices along the way to get us to the point where we're really free. And that and that takes time and that takes process and it takes some choices along the way. I think it's really important that we see in this that God doesn't tell Abraham where he's going to go. You pack everything up and hit the road, and I'll show you when you get there. God would never have been a very good travel agent. <laughs> you know, tour guide, I'll tell you when you get there. Uh, I'm somebody who wanted to know. But now I look at it and I go, you know, if I would have known what my life would have been like along the way and the things I would have been struggling with, I probably wouldn't have signed up for it. Right? You wouldn't have either. And, and, and you look at your life and you go, wow, I didn't know we were going to be doing that. Somehow, God takes us through it. We get through and, we, and we've experienced things that we didn't think we'd be able to get through. And, and we do. And, and he walks through us with it. And I think that's important that he says, you know, I'm going to tell you when you get there. And uh, But you have to leave in order to go, right? Um, I've talked to you about this uh, button that Damien got years ago uh, when he was about eighth grade. And uh, it was a button that said, um, stop change, start. Three words. And he's had that um, for a, a long time, but he, he lost it along the way. And uh, he found it this week. And uh, and he said, Dad, I found my button. And uh, stop, change, start. And he said, you know, five different times in rehab last year, I never actually stopped. In my mind, I never really stopped. I just waited till I got out of rehab and then I'd start up again. And so I wasn't able to change and start over. He said, this is the first time that I've actually stopped, changed, and now I can start over again. And I thought about that in terms of Abraham here because God could have done a lot with Abraham living in his dad's house back at the home where everything was and everybody knew him and stuff. He didn't, did he have to leave? I don't know. But the call was leave. In other words, stop the life that you've had. In that, make the change and then start up again. Stop, change, start. And, uh, and I'll tell you when you get there. Do you know how hard it is for a control freak like me to say, okay, Lord, you tell me when we get there. Anyone else have control issue, issues? See, I'm a control freak. You have control issues. That's kinder, isn't it? That's, that's much nicer. Uh, we want to know. We want to know, are we even on the right road? Are we doing well? Are we progressing? How do we keep score? I'll tell you when you get there. Now you notice, he gets there, and then what's the first thing he does? 
after saying, Lord, thanks, he makes a little altar, what does he do? He backs up and goes away. He goes on to somewhere else. And then when he gets to somewhere else, he makes a little altar, thanks the Lord for it, and then packs up and goes away. And then God's going, wait, I told you when you get there, I tell you, you're there. But now he wants to be somewhere else. And and I, you know, I, I became a Christian under a lot of false notions, okay? I admit that, you know, son of a missionary, <laughs> you'll get no chance to see reality. But um, the thing was, I really had that belief that if you had Christ in your life and you were following Jesus, that you would not have the problems that those sinners had. Those pagans out there have all these problems, but we're different because we have a relationship with God, so we don't have those problems. I believe that lie. And I kept thinking, well, then I must not be a real Christian because I got the same problems that the sinners have. I got the same problems the pagans have. All my friends have the same problems as me. What is different? And then I looked at this passage, and this is so cool. Abraham does everything that God wants him to do. He leaves, he packs up everything, he takes it all with him, he goes to the land. And what does he find there? There's a famine. What is up with that? God takes him some, and you go, Lord, what are you thinking? We didn't have a famine back home. Everything was good. Now you have me bring everybody out here, and we're starving to death. Did you not know where we were going, Lord? You're just making this up? Or, God, your timing is terrible. You couldn't have brought us here in six months when the famine's over? Then I realized those are the kind of questions I'm asking God all the time. Lord, you sure you know what you're doing here? Because, you know, this isn't working out so good. And, uh, and the idea, the conviction that we could be exactly where God wants us to be in our relationship with him and be in the middle of problems is really important. Because sometimes when we find ourselves in the famine and the dry times and nothing's working and we go, oh, I must have got it wrong. Or, oh, I guess God's not there for me. Or, oh, I guess, you know. You don't know. Actually, you're right where God wants you to be. In the famine. In the time of trouble. In the painful stuff. It doesn't mean you're out of God's will because it's painful. It's painful because life's painful. That's what it is. Now, what does it mean for God to call us and get a hold of us? I've been wrestling with this one because I used to think, you know, God calls people to do ministry. But what does he call you to be? What does he call you to do in your life? Maybe he doesn't want you to quit your job, go to seminary for four or five years, and then, uh, uh, you know, try and share Jesus with people. Maybe he is, I don't know. But the thing is, what is it that he's calling you to do? And how do you respond to that? That's the question that I've been grappling with this week. And uh, and this Wednesday at the men's uh, Bible study, we got off on a funny subject. Somebody brought up uh, Bill McCartney, who uh, you've never heard of probably, but years ago he was the head football coach at uh, Colorado, University of Colorado. Took them from an unranked team to a national champion. And then quit. And everybody in the media was going, why is he quitting? What happened? Was he caught cheating? Or is he going to the Dolphins? That's where he's going. I bet the pros want him, and he's going to go to the pros. Now, for 14 years, Randy Rowland and I did this radio program here in Seattle called Everyday People. And we would, it was a Christian radio for pagans. It was on Kington 90 and uh, Cairo radio. And, uh, and we had a chance to interview um, Bill McCartney the year that he quit. And it was really interesting to me because he, uh, we sat him down and I said, okay, look, we, everybody wants to know why you're doing, why did you walk away? 
Why did you just quit for no reason? Tell us. This is really important to everybody. And, and this is what he said. Let me see if I can. He said, my wife and I went to church last fall. We were sitting there in the sanctuary. A guest preacher was preaching. The person was talking about life and success and different things like that. And he said, if you're married, you can measure the success of your life on your wife's face. He said, I was sitting there and I looked over and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, if that's the measure of my success, I'm in big trouble. On her face, he said, with years of pain, of setting aside all of her own dreams, of not sharing, of being ignored eight months out of the year, every year. I sat there and I thought, I know how to build a national championship football team, but I don't know how to be a husband or a father. I walked out and resigned. How does God reach us? What does God say to us? How, how do we measure our success? How do we know when we're on the right track? How, how does God get a hold of us and call us to leave what we know and what we're comfortable with and how we define ourselves and say, okay, I'm going to go into the unknown where all I have is the Lord? That's really scary. That's really scary. And I, I'm sure Bill... McCartney knew who he was when he was coaching. He knew who he was in the a locker room. He knew who he was on the game side. He knew, he knew who he was and was confident as a coach. But then he came home and went, who the heck am I? And I realized, you know, this, uh, that applies to me too. Um, I know where I'm happy and know who I am, but it may not be what God's calling me to do and be. And so, and, and you have the same things in your life. How do you measure your success? It's by how you respond to God's call. And that requires us to listen, to hear him in different ways, to maybe choose to, to leave what we're comfortable in and to go where we don't know. To trust God even in the painful dry times. When things aren't going well, I believe that God has a call for each one of us. It's not just a group call for the church. It's not just a call for me as the pastor. It's it's uh, it, every one of us is called to step out in faith, and that's when our life becomes an adventure. That's what, when it starts to get exciting, when we're over our heads and we don't know what's next and we don't know how to handle these things and we don't know who we can trust and all those things. We go, I guess I'm going to have to trust the Lord in this. Now, personally, I would rather have uh, self-confidence and solid faith rather than having to actually walk by faith. That's different. I would rather... Um, in a wise, spiritually mature way, make all the decisions for my life and yours. You know? Uh, I always think I'd do better than most of that. But then I look at my life and go, haven't done that well. <laughs> and so, uh, but the idea of saying, okay, I'm going to actually step out in a way that um, I'm not able to control it. Um, I'm going to have to actually trust God in the middle of this. That's scarier. That's harder. So your homework assignment. I'm not even going to say should you choose to accept it because that would imply that I'm going to self-destruct in the 15 seconds. So I'm not even saying that. So, But here's your homework assignment. I want you to write down this week uh, in a letter to God. Dear God, it's Tuesday, the day before trash day, whatever you say. And, and write this down and you say, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you have for me? That may mean, what do I have to stop? What do I have to leave? It may mean, where do I have to go? Who do I have to take with me? 
What do you want to have happen to me? And part of it is, Lord, how are you going to measure my life? And then in the weeks ahead, we're going to explore what the call is for each one of us, how he calls us, and how we respond. So I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to surviving next week with my brother and sister. <laughs> Talk about the Lord taking me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> Almost three and a half decades of not talking, and then we're going to have to talk. So I want you all praying for me next week. That would be kind. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Lord, we need you. You know that. We know that. We belong to you. You also know that, and we know that. Now help us to hear your call in our lives and to respond as your faithful people. In Jesus' name, amen.